What's up everyone, my name is Matthew Arrien, I'm a composer and cellist, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on how to write for cello. Now this is mainly geared at composers, it'll give you a very broad overview about how to write for the cello, the different kinds of considerations you have to take into account, like range, tuning, different kinds of standard techniques, as well as extended techniques. So just to give you a sense of the things that I'm going to go over, I'll talk about these technical considerations like range and tuning, as I said, but also basic notation, specifically as it pertains to how to notate frequencies, because the cello has such a broad range that we have to use uh, multiple clefs, and I'll get into that, um, as well as like standard techniques. I'll also talk about mode of sound production. There are multiple ways that you can make sound on the cello, including with the bow or pizzicato. So arco and pits. And Timbre. Timbre is really important. Where you actually place the bow is going to affect the sound. I will also get into the way that, you know, sort of the geography of the fingerboard. Um, chords and multi-stops. Scordatura, which is basically just when you change the tuning. And then so-called extended techniques. Now, extended techniques are basically just like non-standard techniques, like things that you may not see in classical music, like from Beethoven, Mozart, that kind of thing. It's more accepted in like 20th century and beyond music but I'll just get into the various techniques that are considered extended. I'll also talk a little bit more in depth about harmonics, both natural and artificial, uh, multiphonics, and then lastly, I'll talk about subtones. Now, if any of this seems unfamiliar, don't worry, I'm gonna go as in detail as I can about all of these different facets so that when you're actually writing for the cello, you feel confident about the things that you need to take into account to write idiomatically for the instrument. Now the first thing is the range and tuning, right? These are the main technical considerations that we have to take into account when writing for the cello. Now, the range is, I would say, C2 to A6, and it's one of the most expansive ranges of any instrument, not just of the string instruments, but any instrument from like the Western orchestra. And you can play higher, but you should use careful planning and thought as to how the player is gonna get there. So you can use scales, arpeggios, or the, the uh, performer can listen to other instruments in that register, which can be really, really helpful. So you think of it just like with the voice, right? The voice, um, if you don't have perfect pitch, needs to be able to hear what other instruments are playing in order to be able to match that pitch. So when you're in those upper stratospheres of the cello, it's really helpful just to have some kind of reference about where you're supposed to be playing. Up to E5, I would say, is very comfortable for most cellists. So this is basically just this note right here, so you can play all the way up to that note, right, which is a harmonic, so it's a very nice reference for a lot of cellists. And again, you can play higher, but it's good to use sort of like stepwise motion or scales in order to get the player there. Now, obviously, that's not the only way you can do it, um, but I would say that giving them some kind of way of scaling up there or like some kind of ladder, so to speak, in the way that you write your ascent can be helpful. Now, if it starts up there, usually it's good to have some kind of reference, like a harmonic, or if that's not possible, then again, listening to other instruments in the orchestra to sort of match what they're doing. It's very possible to play up there. Now, in terms of tuning, just like the other upper instruments in the string family, it's tuned in fifths. The only one that's not tuned in fifths in the string family is the double bass, which is tuned in fourths. Uh, so the this cello is tuned in fifths from the lowest string to the highest C, G, D, and A. It's the same as the viola, one octave lower. And chords can be built using these open strings as references. Normal unisons are also possible with all but the lowest string. So I'll get into all of the different kinds of intervals that you can create and different kinds of like multi-stops that are really idiomatic for the cello a little bit later on in the video. In terms of notation, because of the large range, the cello uses three clefs. It uses bass clef, tenor clef, which is a C clef where like the second line down from the top is middle C, and then treble clef. And I would notate them in the following ranges. So I've put them on the screen. This is what's very com comfortable for me. I typically don't like to see more than four ledger lines in bass clef above the staff. And then when you switch to tenor clef, I would say like the open A string, which is right in the middle of the staff, is pretty comfortable to read. I think this is super common. Below that, it starts to be a little bit counterintuitive. It starts to be too low. So I wouldn't personally like to see tenor clef um, below the, the A string just because like it could be renotated in bass clef and that's a lot easier to read. 
And then if you're just spending most of the time in this upper register from like middle C all the way up, then I would just use treble clef as much as possible, unless it makes more sense to switch between treble and tenor. So use your best judgment. Um, and again, you can always ask the performer that you're working with what they prefer to see. In terms of standard techniques, we talk about mode of sound production. So in, you can either use the bow or you can pluck, right? There's also things to consider like timbre. So timbre is affected by the contact point and contact point is basically just where the bow is on the string. So it can be close to the bridge, it can be over the fingerboard, or it can be sort of in the default middle position. These are all gonna affect the timbre. We can play single tones, multi-stops, fast scalar pas passages, or arpeggios right and then standard articulations similar to other strings the bow is extremely versatile now the following are considered standard kinds of articulations you can have legato which is basically just when everything's super connected staccato is when everything is super short tenuto is sort of like somewhere in between Jeté or ricochet, I prefer the term ricochet, but jeté or ricochet simply just means like creating this bouncing. It basically just creates this like skittering, skipping stone sort of effect, right? Spiccato is like a vertical bouncing short note, uh, similar to staccato, except that there's a little bit more air to it. So I would say that that's the main difference between staccato. Staccato doesn't necessarily imply that you need to get some vertical air unless sort of like the stylistic um, requirements of the piece that you're playing, like in a classical piece, for example, it's just assumed that that's what's going to be the, the standard articulation. But sometimes composers like to specify. So staccato may mean something different than spiccato. It just depends on the context. And then, of course, tremolo, which is just really fast um, alternations. <laughs> These are all accepted and expected uses of the bow, and this doesn't change from how you think about writing for other strings. You know, every string player is able to do all of these different nuanced uses of the bow. In terms of notation, slurs indicate that notes are grouped into a continuous bow. So the directions of the bows are called down bow when you start from the what's called the frog of the bow, or up bow when you start from the tip. And down bows are typically stronger and require less force to get bigger sounds than up bows. If I want to get that same volume, I really need to like dig into the string, literally like a shovel. Like I have to raise my arm and dig to get that same volume. And that may not even still be at the same like actual decibel level of a down bow, just because you have gravity on your side, right? Um, so you can imagine how notes are slurred together but it's different from other instruments like the piano, for example, which, you know, slurs are more related to phrasing. And so while that's true for strings to a certain extent, there is a limit to the number of notes that you can physically slur. And obviously like tempo and rhythmic subdivisions will vary this limit, but you just have to sort of take that into account. So you wouldn't be able to put like a hundred notes under one bow unless they're all super fast and, and also super quiet, because then you can do you can probably do quite a lot if they're slurred. But if that's loud, then it's, I may only be able to do like 10 or 15 notes at that volume. So you just have to take that into account and think about how the performer would slur notes together physically, but also be open to suggestions uh, if certain things might be better with an altered bowing. Now in terms of pizzicato, or when you pluck the strings, generally string players pluck with one finger. And the reason is because they have to switch back and forth with the bow. If you don't have to use the bow, uh, in other words, like if you have an extended period of time where you're not using the bow, you may actually be able to just change to uh, two fingers and... But if you have the bow in your hand, that's gonna really uh, limit what you can do rhythmically because you can only pluck as fast. It's sort of like with wind players, it's like single tonguing. They can only single tongue t -t 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 so fast. This is sort of like single tonguing, but with, with a finger. So 
So I would say just be conscious that you can't pluck faster than that. And I also maybe wouldn't do that for an extended period of time because you'll tire the performer out. You may notice that I'm using more of my arm and like the arm sort of gets tense in order to play that fast. This is far more comfortable because I have time to sort of like have tension and release of the muscles to be able to play sort of a, a comfortable pace, right? I probably wouldn't want to do faster than that for extended periods of time, unless you have frequent rests. So if you have like... Something like that, where you could just have these little bursts of fast pizzicati, um, but you could also you could also have arpeggiated plucks if you want to create sort of the illusion of faster plucks. And there's one piece where um, Maurice Ravel does this in his sonata for violin and cello. He creates this sort of like hocketed, very fast arpeggiated pluck, um, alternating between the violin and the cello. So you get this digga 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 digga. But they each only land like it's like three eighths and then a dotted quarter or something like that, or triplets and then a quarter. I don't remember what the exact notes are, but it's something like that. So you can, if you have multiple instruments, create the illusion of very fast plucks if they're arpeggiated and you're sort of doing chords, right? Now you can do it either as I did, like descending with the index finger from the top to the bottom, or you can do it from the bottom to the top. So I would just think about how the chord actually lays on the instrument. You wouldn't really be able to do like digga 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 digga. It's it's not going to be super possible unless you have little spaces where like the outer notes are because you sort of need time to set the fingers. But I wouldn't be able to do like digga 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 digga. I wouldn't be able to do it that fast. Um, you can also pluck with the fingernails. But it's a little bit slower. I would just use that with uh, with a little bit of caution and intention. So you just need time to set. Like I need to actually place the fingernail underneath the string. And I keep my nails pretty short because nails just get in the way when you play a string instrument. Um, once they get too long, it's just really uncomfortable. So. I don't have long nails on my right hand like a guitarist would. It's not gonna be as easy for me to just pluck with the finger like a pick. So you just have to take that into account. The main consideration I would say if you're switching back and forth with the bow and pizzicato is to give the player time. Usually it's, it's about a beat or two. That's usually enough time like something like that like just a very brief amount of time. It's not gonna be like, I can't play continuous 16th. It's really hard to do that because I have to really strain. I mean, you can work with the performer to sort of shorten it. If you have a certain, there are certain ways that you actually can do that if that's what the performer wants to just switch like to a, you're still holding the bow in its position, but you just sort of like pivot to place the finger on the string. <laughs> but you have to be at a certain point of the bow, like especially down bow, to be able to pivot quickly so that you don't actually have to give them a huge amount of time to be able to do it, to switch between arco and pits. Now, in terms of contact point, there are basically three main regions of the instrument to take into account. You have soltasto or molto soltasto, ordinario, and sol ponticello slash molto sol ponticello. So soltasto is basically this region here over the fingerboard. And then Ordinario is like the default position of the of the bow. That's normally where a cellist would play, right? That's like the, the most comfortable place for the bow. I think that's what gives you that characteristic cello sound. And then Sul Ponte Cello is close to the bridge. And there are varying degrees for all of these, which I'll get into. Now, Sul Tosto basically, as I said, just means over the fingerboard. And when you play Sul Tosto, most of the upper frequencies of the spectrum are filtered out. So the sound is a little bit less concentrated. It's more round and bassy, almost flute-like. Except in the upper register, it doesn't really sound like a flute, it still sounds like a string instrument, but in the lower strings, since they're thicker, 
you can sort of make the cello sound like a flute, hence the articulation marking like flautando. So it almost sounds like a bass flute or like a contrabass flute. And so, yeah, you'll notice that the higher frequencies, which you would start to hear closer to the bridge, are filtered out since you're far away from the bridge. Ordinario is basically, as I said, just in the middle between the end of the fingerboard and the bridge. So it's, you know, in this range here. So this is the default contact point, and this is what gives you a characteristic cello sound. The frequencies are more balanced and concentrated. You have a good balance of bass, good balance of treble, and everything in between. Compared to sol tasto. Notice that it's a very, very different timbre. Even the volume is significantly less when you play Soltasto. And lastly, Solpanticello is close to the bridge. So the lower frequencies in this case are actually filtered out, and the sound is more piercing and nasally. <laughs> as opposed to the Ordinario or Soltasto. So I'm trying to play roughly the same volume on all three of these different contact points. And as I said, each of them has different degrees. So Solpanticello, Sol if I'm not like as close to the bridge as possible, I get this nasally sound, but if I go even closer to the bridge, it's gonna be even more oriented to those higher frequencies. As opposed to Ordinario, which is much more balanced and you know, has a broader spectrum. So that basically is just what you can think about in terms of contact point and how it's going to affect the, the actual timbre of the notes that you're writing. And obviously you can combine all kinds of different uh, articulations. You can have staccato or spiccato or tremolo. Tremolo in sol with solpanticello is actually quite common. So you can just play with it. Be creative with the ways in which you combine the different factors of timbre um, and articulation. Now, in this slide, I have just like a basic equal temperament layout of how the notes lay on the instrument, just so you can understand the geography of the cello really well, and it will give you a sense of what kinds of multi-stops, scales, etc., are possible on the instrument. Now, I did this in equal temperament just because this is how most of us write music. Now, obviously, like, um, there are different ways that you can divide up the cello into microtones. Since we don't have frets, there's a lot of nuance in terms of the frequency possibilities. Um, so you can do quarter tones, six tones, you can have just intonation and all these different things. And these are things that actually like classical musicians do intuitively when they're tuning chords. The fingers of the, of the hand, the left hand, are numbered from one on the index finger to four on the pinky. And then we use this little funny symbol to refer to the thumb. So cellos and basses both use the thumb at a certain point, just because in the higher register, it's really convenient to have uh, the thumb as sort of an extra finger that you can use to play different kinds of patterns and positions. The most common default playing position for the cello is called first position. It's basically just like a whole step up from the open string and then you play whole step, half step. So you can play three scales with the open strings doing that. C, G, and D. That's first position. That's what you learn when you're learning the cello. So this is sort of like the default place where a lot of a lot of the music that's written for the cello kind of lives. You can also shift up to higher positions. So for example, third position is just a perfect fourth up from the open string. And it's just, again, whole step, half step. And you can easily shift from first position to third position. Now I'm just playing these random patterns to show you sort of the ease that you have. 
And obviously there are other positions. Fourth position is also easy to shift to. So kind of a Mixolydian scale there, but you can easily shift to these higher positions. It's very comfortable, very typical of cello writing. So I would say like, don't be afraid to write beyond the first position. You can do pretty much whatever you want to on the cello. The main things that you have to think about are basically chords because there are certain things that are not possible and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, other common finger patterns though are like half step, whole step, so that would be one, two, four. Uh, or extending the first finger back to a half step above the open string and then doing two, four after that. So again, the, the sky's the limit, you really can do uh, whatever you want, you can write any kind of melody and cellos, cellists are going to find a fingering for it. Thumb position, as I mentioned earlier, is also common. Um, it's very common beyond the octave point because at a certain point you just need that finger. Like you can't just play like, like this. Um, there may be some people that are self-taught who use those kinds of fingerings, but I would say that most cellists who are classically trained would just be comfortable using the thumb at a certain point. They even have like a callus on this part of the thumb uh, because they use it so much. So again, sky's the limit. The following chords are examples of idiomatic voicings on the cello. So the first one is basically just a C major chord where we have two open strings and then a sixth above it. So it's super common, um, as long as you take into account the open strings, you can write all kinds of different chords, right? This is how this particular chord lays on the instrument. So I just highlighted in blue to show you where they are. The lowest on the far left show the open strings. So you can, you can use, you know, two other notes. <laughs> different kinds of intervals since you have those open strings and so you have all of these options for chords but you can also move that open fifth up to a barred fifth to play different chords and these kinds of things are super common for cellists as well now you just have to take into account that this is barred you can't play it with the tip of the finger you do it more with like the fleshy padding of the finger like a guitarist might do it and you actually bar that fifth and so it's a little bit more restricted than with the open strings, but you can still do other kinds of chords over it when you bar these fifths. It's also really common to use um, not just the lowest two or the highest two strings, but even like the middle open strings to build chords. Like this particular chord is common in box music because it's like a it's like a five four two chord in C major. So you sort of are able to resolve it in the same way that we think about voice leading um, in traditional contexts. But you can also build chords which are not necessarily related to tonality. So you can have just things that lay well on the instrument. So this particular chord is just like thinking about which fingers I have available to me and making sure that they're just not on the same vertical plane. Again, when you make use of open strings or you have barred fifths or one finger per vertical plane, this ensures playable chords. Now when I say one finger for, per vertical plane, the only thing that I'm referring to is that you don't have two fingers on the same vertical plane because this makes intonation more difficult and it also restricts the actual reach that your hand has. Um, you could play that same chord by barring and then across like multiple strings. You can do that. And that should work fine. But again, if you bar, it restricts the possibilities for other fingers above it. You basically just have like maybe one or two options. So there are a lot of different kinds of multi-stops that you can do. You just have to think about how it lays on the instrument. And if you are going to have things on the same vertical plane, make sure it's a finger that can actually do it. The fourth finger is pretty weak and so the intonation may suffer just because you may not actually be pushing the string down at an equal amount on all of the different strings. So I would just be conscious of that. The sixths are, in my opinion, one of the easier dyads to play on the cello. They still require practice for intonation and everything, but I would just say the main considerations to take into account are string crossings and rhythm. 
So when crossing strings, uh, please allow time for the player to shift if it moves by an interval other than a fifth. Now, since the cello is tuned in fifths, if you move to, you know, if you move up a fifth with the same interval, it's pretty doable just because you're basically just moving over a string, right? But it still requires time to change hand and finger placement and intonation may suffer if it's at too fast of a pace. It's not like a piano, right? So you have to just take these things into consideration. But with sixths, I could work that up. If I practice more, I can work that up to speed and you can have, uh, I would say, eighth notes at quarter note equals maybe 100 to 115, maybe 120. I wouldn't maybe push it past that just because, um, you know, there are limits to how fast the hand can move and the faster you go, similar to pizzicato, you may end up increasing tension and a lot of things can happen uh, that may, you may not want, like intonation may suffer, maybe you'll have glissandi. If, if that's not something that you're going for, then I might just write them slower so the cellos can play with multiple fingers or that they can sort of mask the shifts with the bow. Like that. So I would just be careful. Um, there are certain intervals which are not quite as easy as sixths. But the sixth lay on the instrument like this. So I played them as a demonstration, but you can also see the way that they lay on the instrument in these various slides. All right, so you get the idea. Other intervals like seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sevenths, and octaves are also possible. The only thing to think about is like the further the fingers are away in the hand, the more physically constrained the hand is gonna be. For example, with seconds, sevenths, and octaves. I'm gonna say this with a grain of salt, most seconds are not possible unless they're in conjunction with an open string or if thumb position is used. Now, actually, most seconds probably are possible, especially in thumb position, but I'm only going to say that just so you keep in mind that they're more difficult because the fingers are so far apart. So if I want to play a second with an open string, it's really easy because I just need to play the open string and then find the second. quite simple when you use the open string. When you try to play that same, if this is now the lower reference, or even a minor second, I, I'm not really able to play it super in tune. Unless I'm in thumb position. And you have to sort of give time, like I wouldn't do fast intervals in parallel motion using those intervals just because intonation is going to be really difficult but if you have a lot of time you can basically write any second that you want to as long as the cellist has time to sort of get in place right you can do quite a few things so just take into account um, the amount of time it takes to basically move the finger up so that's really the only main consideration. You can use seconds, but just be careful since you may need thumb position, so you may need time. Playing slowly is definitely possible. Playing fast, I may not do it. So I would just say use the chart to double check if the double stops that you want to write actually work and always double check with the performer because everyone has different capabilities. Some people are more skilled than others at doing certain kinds of things. Like me, I would be really terrified of seeing octaves just because octaves are one of the hardest intervals to play unless it's with an open string. Just because tuning changes depending on where you are. I mean, that tuning doesn't change. Uh, the, the relative distance of the fingers changes and this is something that you really have to practice. And personally, I haven't put in the time to do a lot of octave practicing, so I would be petrified by that. But other people might not necessarily, because maybe they've done a lot of etude work um, or you know concerti that have these kinds of intervals and they may be more skilled at those and more adept at playing certain kinds of intervals. So always double check with your performer because they can tell you, no, octaves are fine. I would tell you, don't write octaves, but that's just me. Again, any double stop has rhythmic limits and can probably play, I would say at the fastest eighth notes around 120 BPM which I mentioned earlier. Some intervals like thirds, fourths, sevenths, and octaves are a little bit less agile, so just be cautious when writing double stops. Think about what the player has to physically do to achieve those. Certain intervals, especially if you're in a diatonic scale, um, if you do parallel thirds, not all thirds are the same distance. So if some thirds, like a major third, is actually really close. If you play one step up in a diatonic scale, 
you have to extend and so the distance is greater so if you play fast doing those kinds of uh, different uh, distances is going to be quite difficult especially if you slur them on one bow if you separate then you can sort of mask those changes but I would just be cautious with those things whenever you get an extension or you have to use thumb position it's going to be quite difficult in terms of scordatura Scordatura, as I said earlier in the video, basically just means when you tune the strings of the cello other than the standard CGDA. As a rule of thumb, it is always, always, always better to tune down than up. Now, tuning up, even in small amounts, like even as little as a half step, can risk breaking a string because it increases the tension. And good quality cello strings are very, very expensive. So if you happen to have a, ch a cellist tune up and then the string breaks, you kind of owe them that string. Uh, just to give you a sense, like this string cost like $45 when I bought it. It may actually be more expensive now because of inflation, but um, like the they just get more expensive the lower you go on the instrument. So this string was like $120, the C string. Uh, so just to give you a sense, like I would not risk tuning up personally. I've broken strings doing that. And so I know how it feels to sort of do that. And I would not recommend it. So again, always better to tune down than up. The main consideration that you have to keep in mind is to keep enough tension in the strings so that the sound post that's inside the instrument doesn't fall down. Now there's just this like rod that's inside on like the, the you know, your right, my left part of the cello, so it's the left side. And it just sort of like keeps the, I guess the curvature of the cello at a certain height. So you have to just keep enough tension so the bridge doesn't fall down so that then the sound post doesn't, as a consequence of the bridge falling, fall down. I would say a good rule of thumb is no more than an octave down, and that's maybe even pushing it, especially if it applies to all strings, like if you tune all four strings down an octave, that's going to be, I would say, a little bit risky. Um, and also at a certain point, the strings will be too loose, and the bow is probably going to push the string into the fingerboard which you don't really want. So right now at a standard tuning, this is designed so that the tension is such that I don't push the string into the fingerboard, If even if I'm pushing pretty hard. Right? I can still get this really thick sound without pushing the string straight into the fingerboard. More comfortable scordatura tunings, I would say, are within a fourth of the original, but I would say even more commonly are seconds and thirds. So you can see these in all kinds of uh, cello pieces across the literature and even in different centuries like even as early as Bach and it just gives it a different timbre because you're changing the actual tension It's gonna change the quality of sound. So you just have to think about that Keep in mind that changing the tuning can also affect the intonation as changing the tension of the instrument may actually result in unexpected or even undesirable microtonal deviations and for notation Specify if the sounding notes are provided or simply the fingerings, or in other words, this tablature, right? It's really important because uh, the cellist needs to know if they need to be transposing. So if it's like tuned down a minor third, are they reading the sounding notes, like the notes you want them to actually, that you want the to be heard? Or are you just writing the fingering so they play in the same place they always would? So in other words, you would you would notate it as if it was just regular cello writing without scordatura, but the sounding results would be different than what's written. So you just have to specify how your notation actually works so that the cello knows how to interpret it. Now, you can change the tuning while playing, but I would use caution as it is typically difficult to change back unless the performer is given a substantial amount of time. Usually after that moment, the rest of the piece will be in that tuning. Or the detuning will occur at the end of the piece. Now, in this section of the video, I'm gonna talk about extended techniques. Extended techniques are basically just non-standard techniques that maybe orchestral cellists may not use on a daily basis, unless the artistic director of that orchestra is a little bit more warm to the idea of playing 20th, music, 20th century music and beyond. That's really not the case in, I would say, the majority of orchestras, um, at least not yet. Hopefully that changes with time, but in the contemporary concert music scene, these are really not extended techniques anymore. So I just refer to them that way to differentiate them from the standard techniques I talked about earlier. So the kinds of things that we have are like snap pizzicato, overpressure, percussive sounds, like when you play on the body of the cello, um, different ways that you can articulate with the bow, like colegno battuto or colegno trato. 
glissando, where you slide from one note to the another, microtonality, which I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the, the layout of the instrument, decoupled bowing, left hand pizzicato, um, harmonics, which includes natural and artificial as well as multiphonics, and then lastly, subtones. Now there are probably more techniques that I could get into, but for the sake of time, I'll just like address each of these um, in the following slides. So snap pizzicato is used with this symbol. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. It sort of looks like a thumbs up. It's sometimes called a Bartok pitz because Bartok would use these probably in like orchestral writing or his string quartets. And it's basically just a vertical pizzicato that causes the string to snap against the fingerboard like this. So you just create enough um, sort of like potential energy that when it actually, when you release it, it snaps against the instrument. It's really loud. You can't really do a Bartok pizz quietly because then it just turns into a regular pizzicato. So it's really only like sforzando or forte or beyond that. Overpressure, which you can notate as overpressure or OP, um, or using this sort of like double down bow symbol, is a very loud, noisy, and distorted sound when you use too much pressure and not enough speed. And you can do this in different sort of contact points. Usually um, it's combined with sul ponticello, not always, but, and it's also usually uh, paired with unpitched material. So like in Zanakis' music, he will, you, he will aim for just this like very, very aggressive, sort of like distorted, noisy sound. <laughs> this kind of sound. If you actually press a note, you really can't get the overpressure sound. Um, you can sort of get it when, when you're close to the bridge, but it starts to be a little bit more clean and closer to just like a sul ponticello sound. So typically this sound is paired with muting the strings. So it just depends on what kind of music that you write and if this sort of sound is part of your vocabulary. You can also use percussive sounds and I would probably just notate them with X note heads and maybe even use a percussion clef where you assign different parts of the staff to different parts of the instrument, thinking very much like percussion writing. So different parts of the instrument have different sorts of responses if you use your knuckles versus your fingertips or if you want these kinds of like very white noise sorts sorts of sounds. Anyway, so those are like percussive sounds and you can do it either with the hands or the bow. I would maybe avoid using the the stick part of the bow, like the wood of the bow or the carbon fiber, just because this may damage the varnish of the instrument. Like you may notice that I have some nicks here on this part of the, of the, of the instrument. And that's just from doing sort of like arpeggiated bowing where like this part of the bow would repeatedly hit the cello. And so that damaged the varnish. I would just be careful not to use the stick too much because the wood part of the instrument is quite sensitive. And this would also be very different if you're working with a cellist who uses a carbon fiber cello. I don't have a carbon fiber cello and I don't know what it would sound like if you use these percussion sounds. So again, if that's the kind of instrument your performer has, then definitely consult them about that if you're interested in that as a sort of part of your palette of musical options. You can also play Colenio Batuto, which I would simply notate as CLB or just write Colenio Batuto in italics. And this is basically just when when you attack with the, the stick or the wood of the bow. Again, um, I would not do this with a wooden bow because just like the wood of the instrument, it's quite sensitive and these strings are covered with different kinds of metal. So I would say like you can substitute with a pencil or like it could be a mechanical pencil or even a wooden pencil. Let me see if I have one nearby. So you could even use a pen, but I just have a mechanical pencil. So you can do all kinds of things that wouldn't risk the bow necessarily. Like in this case, I have a carbon fiber bow. So if the performer that you're working with has carbon fiber, they wouldn't be so reluctant to use it. 
because it's not as sensitive as a wooden bow and I think that you can get that kind of sound but if you if they are using a wooden bow don't have a carbon fiber bow then a good alternative is a pencil. Collinear trotto is when you play sustains using the wood or carbon fiber part of the bow. It sounds very hollow. There's actually very little core to the sound. I'm not even sure that you can hear it on the recording. But this is something that you can also do to vary the sort of uh, timbre that you're going for to increase the palette of options that's available. Glissando is basically when you just connect um, one note continuously to another by sliding. So... <laughs> And this is, I would say, not even really an extended technique because I think that this is a technique that's probably been used even as early as the 19th century. I wish I had an example to sort of show that, but I don't think that this would be um, super foreign for most cellists just because we don't have fret, so like even certain things sound very cellistic because when you shift, even if you don't intend to, you may get a little bit of a glissando. And you can see even in things like Muse score, the MIDI will actually imitate that. They, when you have these different um, large leaps from one note to another, they'll sometimes assume the cellist or whatever string player is going to use those. So these little subtle glissandi, you can actually specify the notes that you start on. And so that's really quite a common thing. You can do it on one string or multiple strings. Um, Zanakis, for example, does this. This is like my impersonation of Zanakis' music, but you can build these sorts of double stops. You probably wouldn't be able to do multiple stops. Like I would say two is the maximum just because it's harder to play three strings at once. It's possible, but you have to use more force. The next thing is microtonality. So as I said, it's when you play in other tuning systems than 12 tone equal temperament. So you can use like just intonation, you can use equal temperament with quarter tones where like the distance between each note is 50 cents um, compared to like the 100 cents which is a semitone, so that's equal temperament. If you just split that in half, or you split the half in half and do eighth tones, then you can do you know a lot of different kinds of tonality. So we just instead of doing, we would do just splitting the differences between each of these different discrete positions on the cello. Since there are no frets, um, there's a lot of possibilities. But just intonation, I think, is one of the things that string players do intuitively because a lot of the intervals that we have to play, like. major third if you were to do that in equal temperament like if I play this B it's too high for the open G string it's way too sharp so you have to lower it so that it actually matches the overtone spectrum of the G string so this B needs to correspond with the fifth partial of the G string that's just intonation and we do this intuitively with a lots lots of different kinds of intervals like thirds fourths fifths even sixths and sevenths I would say are impacted by this way of thinking about intonation so yeah it's it's very doable for the cello and for other other string instruments as well decoupled bowing is basically when the rhythmic articulations and the activity of the left hand is not synchronized so for example, you can have like a tremolo in one hand that's playing at a different rate as the other hand. So you, sh you can just create these like very chaotic and frenetic textures. You can also, rather than just do like a tremolo, you can just have something like this. So again, it's still very um, chaotic and frenetic. So it's basically just like having some, like two independent kinds of rhythmic activity. 
I would mainly just try not to specify too precisely what those rhythms are, because then it starts to be a little bit too challenging, I would say, for most cellists. Maybe there are some people who are very gifted at playing polyrhythmic kinds of textures where you can play like quintuplets against sextuplets in, in independent hands. I don't think most can, but I, this is just me speculating. I could be wrong. So I would just like leave the rhythm a little bit to chance, have some indeterminacy sort of looped into the way in which the performers are actually producing these rhythms. And if your ideas are already sort of in that chaotic um, energy, then I would say then they're gonna accomplish it very effectively. Now left hand pizzicato, I would just notate like left hand pits or uh, with a plus sign. And this is basically just obviously plucking with the left hand, so. You can do this. Um, you just have to make sure that the player has enough time or fingers to do this. And this can be done while playing with the bow or on its own. So if I do it on its own or I can play an articulation with the bow. And then I can just alternate with left hand pits. Now for me, this is quite intuitive because I also grew up playing guitar and electric bass, but check with your performer. Not all string players um, have this technique in their toolbox. So just check with them first. Um, but I sort of borrow this from guitar where I refer to these things as like hammer-ons and pull-offs. So hammer-ons are like when you slur up from a lower note and you actually articulate the upper note with the left hand. I would use an accent note head to show that that note is being articulated with the left hand. And pull-offs are when you slur down. So you start on the upper note and just actually pluck. You pull off from the note by plucking. So it's another kind of left hand articulation. This works best in the lower registers because there's more string to resonate. And as you notice, it even works on the A string. So not necessarily lower register of the cello, but just like the actual lower half of the string because the higher up you go, the less string there is to resonate. So you can do it but it's gonna be a lot quieter than if I'm that far down, right? That far up, depending on your perspective. For me, it's down because the pitch goes down, but vertically, it's higher. So these kinds of articulations are gonna work best in this sort of like lower part of, of, the, of the neck. Just because, again, there's more string that you can resonate. Now, natural harmonics is a very big topic, but I would notate them first and foremost with diamond note heads. The lower sounding nat uh, natural harmonics of the cello are fairly easy to play. So I, when I say lower sounding, I'm referring to like the octave or the third partial, fourth partial, fifth, and so on. Um, probably up to like maybe six, seven, or eight would, would be very easy to find. So these harmonics, otherwise known as partials, are part of the harmonic series. This means that the sounding results are actually not equal tempered, but microtonal, and I'm gonna say that with scare quotes because they're not actually microtonal, these are just like acoustic phenomena. Actually, equal temperament is sort of microtonal, if we think about it from that perspective, or like these sorts of natural occurring acoustic phenomena. Of course, I say natural again with sort of scare quotes because this is a man-made instrument, but it's a sort of natural effect of putting a string at this tension level on an instrument, so anyway. This is maybe just a tangent that I should just cut from the video. Maybe I'll leave it. So it just means that they're not gonna be the same notes that you would hear on a piano. So when you use diamond note heads, and I probably should have inserted this before that the last bullet point, they are a form of tablature notation, and I would only use them to indicate where the player has to put their fingers. So I personally prefer to see this. I don't really like to see the descriptive notation where you're actually telling the player what note is gonna sound. I like notation to be very simple. Just tell me where to put my finger. And then you can say, you can add like an additional piece of information like this is the fourth partial. For example, you write um, F diamond note head on the C string and then you put fourth above it and then say four in Roman numerals to say it's the fourth string. Mm. And I know that it's that harmonic, right? And you can, you don't need me to know what's the sounding note. You just need me to know what to do. You can also, and I've done this in my own music, add a staff above to show what the sounding notes are if, you re if it's really important for you that the performer know that. Since I have a lot of experience playing these kinds of things, I will probably already just know that. 
but it's helpful to know sometimes if the performer's not quite as versed in natural harmonics. Now in this case, I'm including a chart to show natural harmonics all the way up to the 16th partial on the half of the cell, on the half of the string that's closer to the scroll. So this is the scroll right here. And these accidentals are of my own design and basically just reflect approximate positions on the string. So just as a, like a quick note about the accidentals, I'll just leave this on the screen if you want to pause it to just like read uh, what each of the different symbols means, you can do that. So again, keep in mind that these are close estimates. The harmonics from the 10th partial to the 16th partial are pretty unstable. I would say similar to when you're working in the upper stratosphere of the cello, you should just really try to um, give the performer a way of getting there. If you want to play higher, this is the ninth partial. That's the 16th partial. So you notice that it probably was quite difficult for me to find each of those individually just because the distance between them is so tiny. <laughs> so I really have to listen to what the sounding results are in order for it to work. Now again, it's very unstable and I wouldn't write fast passages using them unless what you want is just like sort of a... Just like sort of sliding unpredictably between them. Now, the harmonics from like the ninth partial to the second are fairly easy to find and can be played as single notes or double stops. And I've done this in my own music, so if you're interested in seeing how that works out, you can find a link to that in the description. But you can play double stops when they're nearby harmonics on adjacent strings. So for example, if I played the fourth partial of the D string with the third partial of the A string, I can do this double stop. Lots of things are possible, similar to when you're writing double stops or multi-stops for fully depressed notes. You just have to think about where they lie on the cello so that you can then find the notes that you're looking for. So feel free to use this chart to find those kinds of things. Um, the same harmonics can be found at the same spot as where the corresponding sounding note is normally played on the half of the string that's closer to the bridge. And I'll explain what I mean. So like, for example, the third partial. This sounds like E5. If you play that same note, where you press the note, so now I'm not gonna play harmonic, I'm actually gonna play. It's the same spot. Whereas when I play the one that's closer to the scroll, it's not the same sounding note. It's actually an octave lower in this case. Or the fourth partial only a fourth up from the string so you get different sounding results when you press the note down but if I played the fourth partial up here it's the same note so you can find those same notes that correspond with each of those higher partials where they actually line up with the sounding notes again when you're in this upper stratosphere you need to give the performer a way to find those notes so There are a lot of options, but you just need to be conscious that they need to be able to listen to where they are to be able to find the note that you want them to find. Now you may have noticed repetitions of notes. This is sort of like a bonus information if you really want to understand how harmonics work. If you don't, then just skip to like the next part, but this is because each of the harmonics is a node on the string and there are repeating nodes. So for example, if you touch the string in the middle node, it divides the string in half. So the frequency is multiplied by two, resulting in an octave higher. So for example, this is the open C string. If I touch it halfway, it's gonna sound an octave higher. Now there's only one middle point. So actually that's there's no repeating node that you can play that same note. This is the only spot that you can do that. But when you touch um, the node, the one third node, you divide the string into three equal parts. So this, this sound, the frequency is multiplied by three, resulting in a sound that's um, an octave plus a fifth higher. Now there are only two total nodes on the string that do that because again, you're dividing it into three. There are two points at which you can cut it so that it's equally in three parts. 
And we could do this for every node above the third partial, but I'll just leave it at that. You can sort of read further into the slide to see how it works. The main thing to think about is like the bottom bullet point, which is if a higher node overlaps with the lower node, the lower one is gonna sound, just because it's, it's a lower denominator and it's closer to the fundamental. So for example, with the fourth partial, the fourth partial, there are three places on the string where you can do that. These are the two outer ones, and then the middle one overlaps with the second partial. And the second partial is just gonna sound because even though it shares a node with the fourth partial, this is just a stronger node. So it's gonna just gravitate towards the lowest common denominator. So in this case, that's the second partial. It will vary depending on where on the instrument you're playing and which nodes overlap with which other nodes. I can probably get the fourth partial to sound. If I try to play more sul ponticello and filter out the lower one. Or if I actually touch another position which has a fourth partial node. For this particular harmonic, it's sort of not necessary to do that because I can just easily play the fourth no partial, but for other kinds of partials, which are a little bit higher, like maybe the 10th partial, it may actually be helpful to, over to play at the same time as the fifth partial. Right, this is the fifth partial. If I want the 10th partial, I just put my finger down where the 10th partial is. And I can actually make it more stable by playing at the same time as the 5th partial, because then I'm dividing the string into 10 equal parts and touching two nodes to sort of reinforce and force that particular note to sound, rather than if I just play the 5th partial, which actually overlaps with one of the 10th partial nodes. And so you just push it in the favor of the higher one by having the actual division of the string playing on two, on two spots at once. Now, artificial harmonics are directly related to natural harmonics, but they're limited to what the hand can physically reach. So the most common ones are touch perfect fourth, where you play and just like stretch to a perfect fourth above the, the note. You can also do touch major third minor third or major second. In this case, major second is going to sound like a ninth or a slightly wide major second is going to be two, uh, three octaves above the fundamental. So you can use different kinds of notation to specify that and you can also just say above that which partial that you want. These particular ones are going to sound as I've notated here. So you have the perfect fourth, which is the most common. So this is either gonna be played, like if you have enough time, you can just stretch, or it's gonna be played in thumb position. Then you can have the third, the minor third, or the second, which you can just play in regular position. This sounds like a ninth, or the eighth partial. So again, you can use special notation based on how I notated it. Um, the eighth partial would, would actually sound, but I probably, in this case, should have used a different accidental to show that the eighth partial is a little bit wider, so I might want to just make sure that the performer is conscious of that so that they don't accidentally get the ninth one. Multiphonics are just specific points on the string where you can encourage multiple harmonics to sound at once, and it's because, uh, as, as I sort of went into, there are multiple places on the string where nodes overlap or where they're really close together. So you can touch a place on the string where certain nodes are really close to each other and make them sound at once. So for example, one of the ones that's the most stable, I would say, is when you play close to the fifth partial and the seventh partial. If you play that middle point that splits the fifth and the seventh, you can actually make both of them sound simultaneously. And obviously things like um, pressure, contact point are gonna affect the timbre of the multiphonic. And you're also probably gonna get a little bit of the open string sound because it's like there's so much uh, energy that it wants to vibrate. 
You can play them quietly or loudly. You can play double stops. So, so really there are a lot of options. I would encourage you to visit cellomap.com so that you can learn a lot more about this because they actually have a lot of very detailed resources like recordings and notation about how these different multiphonics um, work on the cello. So definitely check that out. But things to consider are that not all multiphonics work equally well across strings. On the upper strings, you can get these multiphonics too. But you'll notice that they're not always super stable. They have a little bit of instability just because there's a conflict between which sorts of um, nodes are trying to emerge. So you have to find like the right balance to make sure that you just create this middle point, this gray area where you can have multiple nodes sounding at once. Sometimes adding vibrato can actually help to stabilize it because it sort of like averages out the actual position that's being touched. There are certain ones that certain multiphonics that I've personally found as a cellist that may not be on cellomap.com. This one is my favorite. Sometimes what's actually really helpful, so this may be helpful if you're talking with a cellist or if you're a cellist and you're watching this and you're trying to figure out how to make them work, sometimes it's really helpful to get the higher note first and then adjust the pressure to be able to actually get the multiphonic to sound. Sort of similar to how woodwind multiphonics can sometimes work, where like if you play a certain note first and then phase in the rest of the multiphonic, it helps to just keep it stable. So that's similar to the cello in that sense. And then the last thing that I'm going to talk about is subtones. So subtones is basically when you use overpressure to force the string to vibrate at a different rate, which causes the note to drop below the pressed one. So for example, if I take this note D and I use overpressure and slow down the speed, I can force the pitch to drop, in this case, down a major seventh. But it's always going to be a sort of a break. It's not going to be like a continuous sound from one to the other. It'll just at some point pop into the other one. I like to hold the bow in my fist because it gives me a little bit more control. And you'll notice that like the more you slow down the string's vibration, at least this is how, I don't know scientifically if that's exactly what's happening. I think that's how it works. So when you slow it down even more, the pitch goes down further. Now you probably notice that it's not a very stable thing. It's actually super unstable. And the pitches I've written on this slide are very uh, relative. And you can't really pick out the notes at will. With the exception of maybe the first subtone, which... You probably can actually stabilize it quite well. But it's always going to oscillate with the closest nearby, either lower or higher. That's just the way that it's going to work. So it may os oscillate back and forth between like the de depressed note that you're playing, the normal one. Or the next one down, which you may have just heard happen. As you go lower on the instrument, there are going to be fewer subtones below that. Like in this case, I'm able to probably get up to six. Now 
not very stable. But the lower that you go, the fewer there are because those resulting subtones are just going to be below audible frequency or below 20 hertz. <laughs> So they just turn into rhythms, like If it's above 20 hertz, then you're gonna hear a pitch, but just keep that in mind. It's easier to do the first subtone down. It's also possible to get the second one if the cellist is really concentrating on making it possible, but it's still going to oscillate between like the one that's nearest by, either the one just above it or the one just below it, or even maybe two in its vicinity. So just be open if you're going to use subtones to that kind of like instability of the resulting sound. Another thing that's really important to know, and I haven't done like substantial research on this to actually figure out what the sounding results are going to be depending on where you play them, but the sounding results and intervals may actually vary depending on where the note is played on the cello. So if you play it a little bit higher, it may not be a major seventh, it might be slightly smaller, like in this case it sounds more like a minor seventh, but it's microtonal, it's not quite, like pitch is relative. So. I would just say like be open to the kinds of results that are going to happen, collaborate with the performer to be able to pinpoint the specific things that are going to happen if you are writing subtones in these upper ranges. I would say just like use them carefully, consciously and collaboratively. So this concludes my presentation on writing for the cello. I hope that this was a valuable and helpful um, guide on what kinds of sounds you can get with the cello. I've Try to be as thorough as possible, but if you still have any questions about the kinds of things that are possible with the instrument, then definitely leave a comment below. And I would encourage you also to, if you like these kinds of videos, then like the video, subscribe to my channel, because I'll be posting different kinds of things that are helpful for composers uh, in the future. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.